Well, good morning. Y'all doing well? I have to be honest with you that uh, normally about this time of year, the calendar kind of chills for a little bit. You know, everything calms down, everything. That hasn't happened. That has not happened in the least this year, and I, I'm not sure if it portends something in our future, but I hope it is good, and I hope it, uh, hope it does, and I hope it's good. Uh, but you guys can go to Children's Church now, uh, and yes, the rumors are true. Today is, in fact, my birthday. I am 42 years old. Ha! I was waiting for that. I got socks older than you, Junior. Yeah, that, see, pastors don't, in pastoral world, somebody could be 99 talking to a 97-year-old with his last breath in the hospital bed in hospice. He will use his last breath to tell the 97-year-old pastor how young and inexperienced he is. That's how it is. But I understand, you all know, that 42, apparently, in popular culture, is the answer to life, the universe, and everything. I've been waiting for this year my whole life. Yeah, baby. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's irrelevant. Lots of people in here are on that front. That doesn't mean you're not old. <laughs> all right. Ah. Uh, Anyway, but thank you for the birthday wishes. We have a lot going on this Sunday, actually. These, you know, talk about youngsters, Kay. These young grown-ups right here, I think, are, this is y'all's last Sunday, right? Y'all are moving to Del Rio, of all places, a booming metropolis with lots of things to do on Friday night. Uh, but they're, they're moving off. Uh, what else do we have? We have Clara. Clara, wave your hand back. Clara signed on the dotted line. She's a bona fide member, going to... Vote in our meeting uh, to come. By the way, our meeting is still after the service today, and you are all welcome to stay. In fact, we want you to stay. Um, only people that have signed on the dotted line uh, for members may vote. But there, this, it's not like a weird mystery cult meeting, okay? It's an open thing. You can come and hear how things go and how we do things, and we want you to do that because it, it's open. Uh, but only those who have signed on the dotted line there as members can, can vote. So just keep that in mind. Um, if no other reason, there's plenty of barbecue, right? It's already cooking in there. I believe we have official taste testers in, our, in the room with us here, Kevin and Tony. Was it okay? It, oh, it was acceptable. I can't, that's not a biblical office in the church, by the way. Y'all don't get any extra credibility with Jesus for serving that way, just trying the barbecue. All right. We have a lot going on. It's a busy week. Turn your Bibles to John 18, please, if you would. We're going to cover the first 11 verses, Lord willing, and the crick don't rise, as they say. But we've finished, well, Jesus has finished, and therefore we have finished uh, the high priestly prayer in which uh, Jesus is interceding for his disciples who will carry on his work, that will live their lives not only in him, but Christ in them, fulfilling his ministry, bearing much fruit into eternity, because they are abiding disciples of his. Meaning that they're going to rest in who they are and never doubt for one second what their destiny is, where their eternity lies, and why it lies there. And then they're going to do what Jesus says to do. That's a distinction that he made starting in chapter 15 with the, the vine and the branches. And we focus very narrowly on this room and this prayer and this conversation, uh, which began several chapters ago in which Jesus is praying for and instructing his disciples. But there have been other events uh, continuing in the background. Uh, you remember in chapter 13, verse 27, perhaps, maybe you don't remember those in chapter 13, verse 27, but you remember when Jesus, the last words he spoke to Judas were, what you do, do quickly. So he was dismissed in order to act promptly to proceed in the course of events that he had determined to do. And then Jesus took that opportunity to give final instruction to his disciples. Events are in progress. Events that are at this juncture necessary for Jesus to continue and to fulfill the purpose for which he came to this earth in human form, in the form of a bondservant. This is verse 18, or chapter 18, verse 1. That when Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples. And my text says, over the ravine. Doesn't that sound exciting? Over the, the brook, perhaps. 
They didn't go over a ravine and, you know, like parachute, uh, but they went over this brook, this low, high spot, over the ravine of the Kidron, where there was a garden in which he entered with his disciples. Now Judas also, who was betraying him, knew the place, for Jesus had often met there with his disciples. Jesus then, having received the Roman, or Judas then, excuse me, having received the Roman cohort and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. So his garden we know by name from other passages. Uh, John doesn't consider that as part of his record. It's the Garden of Gethsemane. And they go, this was a place that Jesus frequented in this area. Uh, he went with his disciples to there. Uh, that place there to, to be together, perhaps to instruct, to pray, as they were doing now. And Judas knew that place. John is very clear. He says, now Judas also, who, my actually has it in the past tense. This is a present active participle, who is betraying Jesus. That's the narrative progress here. Judas also, who is betraying him, knew the place where Jesus had gone there often. He's actively, presently, with his actions right there in his mind, betraying Jesus. There's no more clear way to say that he was presently in that process. By the way, I know some people don't agree with me on this, and that's okay. As I say, I run into wrong people all week. But that means that there's a demarcation between the point at which Judas became a betrayer and when he was not. In the present tense, the present active participle here, he is betraying Jesus. There was a set of actions in which he was engaged at this present time that made him a traitor. And we've made this distinction that Judas, I do not believe, was, he was not an infiltrator. In other words, he was not following Jesus with nefarious purposes from the very beginning, but that he became a traitor. And I believe Scripture is very clear about that. There's one more indication here, that he became a traitor. There was a point in time that this happened. And here he does that by bringing a witch hunt posse. I don't know other better way to say it. This, look, this sounds like the old Frankenstein's monsters movies, right? They come with, with pitchforks and swords and lanterns to come and get the, the terrible monster that they're scared of. They go and get a Roman cohort and the temple guards uh, this is um, a bipartisan effort. Don't you like the word bipartisan? It sounds so nice. Uh, John tells us that these are from the Pharisees and the chief priests, meaning the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the Democrats and the Republicans. <gasps> it's bipartisan. Those are political parties. And they were acting together for this. And as the great philosopher George Carlin once said, Bipartisan usually means there's a greater than average deception taking place. It means nothing different here. In this case, certainly that's true. So Jesus, knowing all the things that were coming upon him, all the things that were coming upon him, We could name them. We, we name some of them when we take the Lord's table. Every betrayal, every curse, every blow, every lash, every drop of blood, every emotion, all of it. He knew that. He did not know everything. He had voluntarily surrendered the omnis in their, in their perfections that he possessed as God the Son. But he knew these things with the other absolute expressions of those things. He, he, he set those aside. But he knows the things that are about to come upon him. So, you know, we talk. We talk often uh, in our world that is, uh, that is fraught with violence. We, we, you know, August 3rd. The day these two young people were married, by the way. Someone went in and shot up a Walmart. You know what was absent from that? As far as I can tell, every video I've watched, every report I've watched, no one ran towards the shooter until he was good and done. 
Now, I'm going to tell you, when you're in the face of danger, you don't know you're going to die. There's a risk that you might die. There's a risk you might feel pain. There's a risk that you might become a victim of violence. And we refer to a man as a hero who overcomes that risk assessment part of his brain and goes forth towards the violent offender, the murderer. Jesus had no lack of certainty as to what was coming upon him. He knew every last thing. And yet John tells us that he went forth to them. Face to face, that whom do you seek? Whom do you seek? Would you need to have asked that question? I mean, Jesus didn't need to ask the question. Jesus knew who they were looking for. Pitchforks, swords, lanterns, Romans, the bipartisan temple guards from the Pharisees and everybody else. And they're standing in, a, in a, the Garden of Gethsemane, a peaceful place with implements of violence. And I would imagine the expressions on their faces left no doubt as to their intent. Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus the Nazarene. And he said to them, I am. I am. He said this a lot in John. Don't put the pronoun after it. He's not merely handing them a verbal business card saying, I am Jesus of Nazareth. This is a statement of his essence. I am. I am whom you are seeking. I am the one you are seeking, but I am. How do I know that he was not just doing that, just self-identifying? Because of the response. He said to them, I am. And Judas also, who was betraying him, was standing with them. So when he said to them, I am, they drew back and they fell to the ground. Does that happen frequently when you make introductions? It doesn't happen to me a lot. Sometimes people get faint. And here's why. Because in El Paso, I am a giant. And they stand too close. They get inside the personal space, and they don't realize how far they have to look up. And they keep going backwards. But that's before the introduction. <laughs> they don't just draw back and fall down. He's not just saying, I'm the dude you're looking for. I am. So the response, they drew back. They fell down, all of them, even the ones betraying him. They drew back and fell down. They fell prostrate. By the way, it's a little picture of another biblical principle, right? Every knee will bow. Every tongue confess. Don't let me catch you, by the way, telling people how to go to heaven when they die and telling people that you need to make Jesus Lord and Savior of your life. Bad language. Bad vocabulary. You know why? Jesus is Lord of your life. He's Lord of every Buddhist life. He's Lord of every Muslim's life, of every unbeliever's life, everybody's life. In fact, in a very real sense, he's Lord of all creation. You don't have to make him Lord of anything. He is Lord. He's Lord of these guys. I am. People just need to believe in Jesus. They don't need to make him anything. Can you imagine making Jesus anything? Are you, you can't even make me anything. I've told you all before, I know you all wish I would dress better, but you can't make me. It's all there. And if you can't make Pastor Josh do something, what do you think you're going to make Jesus? You're going to make Jesus into something? Jesus is who he is. That's what he says, I am. You are what? I am. Let's try it again. Therefore he again asked them. Jesus is very gracious. These guys are a little slow. He again asked them, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus, the Nazarene. 
Jesus answered, I told you that I am. So if you seek me, let these go their way. I, I think they're not even making eye contact. John hasn't said that they stood back up. They drew back. They fell down. Uh, yes, sir, Jesus, sir. We're looking for Jesus the Nazarene, sir. That's the picture. You seek. Well, I already told you that I'm who you're looking for. So let these other 11 guys, let them go. John gives us a very interesting explanation. It's in verse 9, To fulfill the word which he spoke of those whom you have given me, I lost not one. Now if you go back earlier to earlier chapters of John where Jesus says that in his high priestly prayer to God the Father, many people will will assume, they will speculate in that passage that Jesus is talking about the disciples' possession of eternal life. See, I didn't lose one, but I lost Judas, except for him, I lost him. And I think they're talking about somehow, somehow in the mishmash of their minds, without really examining even this immediate scripture after it, they assume that that context of saved versus lost is talking about somebody going to heaven when they die. And I think I mentioned back then, if you remember, that it doesn't. This is one of the reasons why. John tells us what Jesus meant, right? I am he, let these go. And it was in order to fulfill the word which he spoke, of those you have given me, I lost not one. What can the Roman cohort and the bipartisan temple guard take away from the disciples? At worst. What's the worst you can do to me? Not that you, I know you love me and I love you, but if you take a, uh, a, a weird turn and you want to do me harm, what's the worst that y'all, any human can do to another human? Take their life. Jesus said, don't fear those who can kill the body. <laughs> that's, that's the extent. That's what Jesus meant when he says, I lost not one. He says, I preserve their safety. I preserve their lives. Because in that ministry, following Jesus that close was dangerous. You know what? It's still dangerous. People still die because they are abiding disciples of Jesus Christ. Because they are resting in who they are. It gives them courage and bravery and resolve to keep his name at the forefront of their lives. To proclaim his name. It's not safe. But Jesus said, I lost not one of these. This is what he meant. They're still, hearts still pumping, synapses still firing, lungs still creating a vacuum, absorbing oxygen, supplying the vascular system with the oxygen that is necessary. Sometimes that's what saved and lost refers to. Here it's very clear. So Simon Peter then having a sword drew it, and stuck the high, struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Good for Peter. I'm not joking. Y'all are laughing. I'm not joking. You know what Jesus was concerned about right then? Keeping them alive. That's what he said, of all that you have given me, I have lost not one, and this is fulfilling it. Take me, leave these guys alone. Good for Peter. He did the best that he could possibly do according to his knowledge. If you can look at somebody at risk of losing their life and not feel that you need to save it, you need to check yourself. Seriously. He's not in Jesus' head. Jesus knows everything about Peter, but Peter does not know everything about Jesus. He knows that there is a cohort of Roman guards with weapons and lights lynching them in a garden. And he wasn't aiming for the ear. I don't think. I, at least, you ever heard somebody, why, why didn't that cop shoot him in the leg? He didn't have to kill that boy. He could have shot him in the leg. You shoot somebody in the leg, you need to put your gun back in the holster. 
Besides the fact shooting somebody in the leg and kill them in 30 seconds, depending on where the leg gets shot, some dangerous things in the leg to lose. You lose a lot of hydraulic pressure right here. Good for Peter. He was not perfect. He was not right. But he acted according to the best of his knowledge, I believe. Jesus corrects him, but not harshly in other passages. We find that Jesus takes the ear and restores it. You know, back in the, when I was a kid, uh, people would get, they'd go to concerts. I didn't go to concerts. I was a good Baptist. I didn't go to sinner concerts like that. But all my sinner friends went to concerts. And they would come to school with their hand signed by some rock star that they wanted, right? You didn't want to shake hands with them because they hadn't washed that hand in a month. Can you imagine what Malchus did with that ear? <laughs> Got stuck back on by Jesus. Amazing. Amazing. Jesus had instructed them to have their swords. In fact, he said, go sell your coat buy one. You can look it up. People don't believe me when I say this. Luke twenty two thirty six. He who has no sword, let him sell his cloak and buy one. By the way, don't use swords these days. Buy a pistol. Swords are very hard to use effectively. When you aim for the head, you hit the ear. I mean, I'm not kidding. I actually had somebody tell me one time that they felt comfortable and safe in their home because they had like an imitation broadsword over their fireplace. I said, you are stupid. You haven't spent your whole life training with that. It would be like some dummy with no chest muscles at all saying, I'm protected by this longbow. Go read some books, man. They trained you from when you were six to shoot a longbow because otherwise you were too weak and snivelly to do it. Buy a gun. Jesus said so. We're supposed to use discernment when we exercise it, but Jesus wanted us to defend ourselves and others as his disciples. This was an exception. Luke tells us he put the ear back on. But Jesus knew, remember, he knew what must happen. He knew what was coming upon him, and so that helps us understand why, why this was not the best thing that Peter could do. So Simon Peter then, having a sword, drew it, stuck the high priest slave, cut off his right ear. The slave's name is Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put the sword into the sheath. The cup which the Father has given me, shall I not drink it? That's not the phrase we focus on, is it? Other Gospels tell us about Jesus praying to the Father in the moments prior to this, hours perhaps prior to this. Praying to the Father, and it says that his, his sweat was like drops of blood as he was interceding even now for himself to the Father, and he prayed, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. The cup was painful. He knew all the things that were coming upon him. But when he comes forth and stands against the Roman cohort and the temple guards, and he has put this ear back on to Malchus that, that, that Peter had cut off, Jesus knows what's coming upon him. And he has never been uncommitted to it. He's committed to it entirely, submitted to the Father's will. The cup which the Father has given me, shall I not drink it? The cup sounds like pain, doesn't it? Anybody? The cup feels, it sounds like pain. You remember the some of y'all weren't here. By the way, come here for the singing and the scripture reading. Get up a little earlier, come to church. You're missing out. If you're not here for the scripture reading and the singing, it's usually connected. I'm not, I'm not, that wasn't too harsh, was it? It's what you should do, right? Some people tell me as a pastor, I shouldn't tell people what to do. I should just tell them about the Bible. Well, you're missing the Bible if you don't come on time. Is the, I mean, that's just a reality. That's why we do the scripture reading. 
So if your butt isn't in the seat for announcements in the Bible reading, you're missing out on something. You're missing out on the worship. So I don't think that's overbound. It's okay if you don't agree. Turn over to Psalm 16. Wow, man. Psalm 16, this is the passage that Steve read. It's actually a messianic passage, most people's estimation. This is a fairly new Bible. I can usually find things faster in my older one, but it's losing pages. 16, Psalm 16, verse 5, The Lord is the portion of my inheritance and my cup. I thought the cup was pain. David says, the Lord is my cup. Inheritance in my cup. You support my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Indeed, my heritage is beautiful to me. I will bless the Lord who has counseled me. Indeed, my mind instructs me in the night. I have set Yahweh continually before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will dwell securely. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, the grave. Nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You will make known to me the path of life. And in your presence is fullness of joy. And in your right hand there are pleasures forever. Now you know David's life. Do, well, do you know David's life? You know David's life enough to know that David's life was not all a bowl of cherries, right? You know that he suffered. You know that much of Psalms, at least half of the Psalms, but when you read the first half of them, it's David complaining that the Lord isn't doing what David thinks he ought to do. The Lord is not fast enough in saving his bacon. The Lord is not fast enough in keeping his promises. He's worried his enemies are going to destroy his life and all his children's lives. Sound familiar? <laughs> Sounds like pain. David isn't perfect in his remembrance, but in this passage, he, he remembers that the Lord is his cup. And in it is blessing. Regardless of what it requires. So back here in John... When Jesus says of the cup his Father has given him. The cup which the Father has given me. Shall I not drink it? What's in the cup? Blessing? Glory? Does it look like pain? Yeah, it looks like pain. It's like death. Suffering. And Peter says, or he says to Peter, the cup which Father has given me, shall I not drink it? The difference is that Jesus knows all the things which are coming upon him. That means he not only knows, as I said earlier, I set you all up. He knows not only the curses, the blows, the stripes, the blood, the pain, the humiliation, the piercing of his hands, his feet, and his side. He knows all the things which are to come upon him, including the glory that is to come through it. So my cup doesn't hold the same thing that Jesus' cup holds. Unless you want to try to prove to me from the Bible that I'm supposed to Lay my life down as propitiation for the sins of the world, which you cannot do, so don't try. My cup holds something different than Jesus' cup holds. But he has a purpose. We've talked about that as we talked about the abiding disciple of Jesus Christ in John 14, 15, 16, 17. Does he have a purpose for you? Yes. Is there glory to be found in it? Even reward. <gasps> That's how Scripture talks about it, as a reward. But can you and I see the cup which the Lord has given us? Can we drink it dry and know that He has blessing 
through it? I don't know many people that do. I know it's possible to have confidence in Jesus Christ. The cup may be bitter going down, but God has planned good, glory, and blessing through it. So as the Lord gives you a cup, drink it dry, knowing that he is good and faithful. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you most of all for your son. And we learn about in this word, of his faithfulness, of his love, of his commitment to your purpose in his life, to drinking the cup that you have given to him, knowing all the things that were coming upon him. Father, today uh, we ask for discernment and for wisdom and understanding to the best of our ability through your word by your spirit the cup that you would have us drink in this life to fulfill our purpose in your son's name we pray amen